Good evening, dear audience online. Good evening, dear panelists behind the stage. I am Mar Maria Voratilina, a curator of the event tonight that takes place within the framework Other Europe, Perspectives on Identity and Diversity, created by my colleague Corinna Humusa. The events within this framework are presented at Camp Nagel together with the network Diplomats of Color from late September until December this year. The series highlight the diasporic and minority perspectives on European culture, history, and the present in order to override the homogeneous constructions of European identity. In the current post-colonial and decolonial discourses, the topics of Western-Eastern relations comes rarely into focus. When we talk about other Europe, we, on the one hand, talk about diversity, and then on the other hand, bring up the topic of othering that exists within it, where, for example, relations between Eastern and Western Europe have had a particular place for centuries. There are sometimes obvious and very often invisible colonial structures in place that define the hierarchical relations between Western and Eastern Europe, where the latter is put in the role of the oppressed one. Economic exploitation, discrimination of migrants from the post-Soviet states, existing topic of Western values opposing to the other, the low-grade ones, are only one of the few discriminative structures that support colonial dominance within these relations. At the same time, we cannot underestimate the role of decolonial practices existing and developing, particularly, but not only in the field of art, that dismantle these structures and suggest a new alternative one. Therefore, it is important for us to highlight the Western Eastern European relations, bring them once again into the focus of post-colonial and decolonial discourses. I'm extremely excited to introduce the guests of this evening, Madina Tlostanova, who will present her keynote at the first part of the event. She is a decolonial thinker, novelist, and professor of postcolonial feminisms and, uh, at Linköping University in Sweden. She focuses on decolonial thought, especially in its aesthetic, existential, and episte epistemic manifestations, feminisms of the global south, the post-socialist human condition, fiction, and art. Her recent books include What Does It Mean to Be Post-Soviet, Decolonial Art from the Ruins of the Soviet Empire, and A New Political Imagination Making the Case. After the keynote, Madina Tlostanova will be joined by the Migrations and Transformations researcher Yanis Panayotidis, as well as Kiev-based curator and art critic Lisa Kulchinska for a panel discussion afterwards. The panel will be moderated by Yuri Vassenmüller. Uh, they are political scientists, journalists, and columnists working and writing about the topics of queer feminism, class, post-Soviet migration, and their intersections. Yuri is Berlin-based, but is currently with a research scholarship in St. Petersburg. Uh, during the last 15 minutes of the event, the discussion will be open for the questions from the audience. You can send your questions during the whole event in various messengers to the phone number plus four nine one seven seven six nine zero four two nine five. The phone number is also mentioned in the description of this live stream. I'm very, very thankful to all the participants who agreed on the short notice to take part in this event. And I'm, uh, I'm now giving the floor to Madina Tlostanova and wishing everyone a very good evening. Thank you very much, Maria, for this generous introduction and for inviting me to take part in this event. It's, it's really my pleasure and my honor. Um, of course, the topic we're discussing is huge, uh, so I will try to concentrate maybe on several, you know, important nodes uh, that I hope will trigger the future discussion also. So, first of all, if we look at Europe not um, as a conglomerate of different nation states, uh, not as a geographical subcontinent, uh, but rather as a set of ideas and ideals that in many ways have determined the life of, of most people on this planet in the last 500 years, then we will have to agree with many scholars, uh, Enrique Dussel or Janet Abelhoud, among others, who pointed, that, uh, pointed out that Europe emerges together with modernity. The two are indissolubly connected. Without the one, the other doesn't exist. 
And therefore, uh, it's the arrival of modernity, understood not as an objective, uh, you know, temporality, God-given or progress-driven temporality, but rather as a set of practices, a set of beliefs, uh, and also conceived by specific groups of Europeans that turns this previously poor, marginal, rather blurred uh, in its boundaries region that actually was not that successful economically because of its unfortunate position in relation to the main trade routes that existed and major markets of the time, uh, which was very kind of modest in its political and cultural achievements. And all of a sudden, it turns into a center of the emerging world system and universal world history. Uh, therefore, we need to speak uh, not of Europe and not of modernity, but of Euro-modernity, perhaps, right? Taking the postmodernist skepticism further and questioning not just modernity, but also its European provinciality, so to say, pretending to be universal. Uh, the colonial thinkers have claimed uh, that the rise of Europe as a new center of the world has been consistently marked with a division into the lighter side and the darker side. Again, quoting uh, Enrique Dussel and many others. The lighter side was uh, what we still find in most historical textbooks. It's all about rationality, human rights, equality discourse, justice, freedom, democracy that most people still associated with Europe. Whereas the darker side was and is the irrational side, the irrational realm or that justifies violence, uh, systematic inversion of human rights, the stability of human and other lives, and ultimately physical annihilation and sometimes genocide of any others that do not belong to this Euro-modernity, that are disqualified from it. So this kind of doppelganger structure of European identity, classifying all humans in relation to their closeness, to their proximity to itself, and attaching soon naturalized tags of others, absolute and relative others, uh, has been pointed out, of course, many times. No matter how drastically uh, its concrete configurations were shifting or changing, the main principle has remained the same. It has taken the human element away from the people who were discarded from this spatial temporal concept of Euro-modernity, in which it's not possible to divide temporality from specific European spatiality. Uh, yet this very spatiality is somehow consistent measuring rod of all humans for other species of the planet at large. This system has built a mechanism of self-legitimation uh, and has presented itself as a delocalized you know, vantage point with um, rational subjects who possess a self-proclaimed moral superiority and intellectual superiority over the others. So the idea of Europe uh, as a civil and circular identity divorced from ethnic, racial, religious, or geopolitical belonging is then torn to pieces when it, comes to when it comes to real practices that are still informed by the human hierarchies that were launched together with and as a part of modernity. So, for example, if we take the lighter side, um, uh, it, of course, we know that it allowed as early as in 19... Uh, 48 to adopt the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which attempted to consider the devastating experiences of the two world wars and totalitarian regimes of Nazism and Stalinism. But it was once again a, a clear expression of European, Euro modern uh, keeping up with the appearances and silently following the double standards, stating once again that all human beings are born free and equal in dignity in their rights, the declaration couldn't possibly and was not interested in guaranteeing any mechanisms of keeping this equality functional and actually actually working, yes? Even if we are all born equal, we stop being equal shortly after we're born. Uh, and one of the reasons for losing our equality in the modern colonial world is, of course, racism, as well as gender, sexuality, geopolitics, religion, language, and many, many other intersecting and mutually translatable 
tools of discrimination that make, uh, let's say, core Europeans more equal than others, if we want to quote George Orwell's famous paradox that some animals are more equal than others. Uh, after the end of the Cold War and the emergence of the idea of united Europe, the same logic has been revamped in the treatment of migrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and the internal European divisions and to core Europe and the so-called new Europeans, or let's say the south of Europe and the Nordic countries, those who are left forever uh, in this waiting room to join the EU, and those who have always lived in Europe but were never fully accepted as its part, or gradually forced to become some kind of pale copies and forever retarded shadows of the benevolent civilizing Europeans. Uh, various European groups uh, marked by difference have been uh, controlled by the uh, Foucauldian biopolitics and uh, indented as others by the imperial knowledge based on its ontologized sexual racial differences hierarchies. Uh, so uh, all of this is not news, of course, but what maybe be has become more obvious in the current climate of chronophobia, lacking political imagination, imperceptible normalization of this permanent state of exception, uh, very often outside of actual zones of conflict and war, uh, this kind of derelational knowledge and sensibility uh, all of that has led to, uh, as you know, the emergence and re-emergence of the ultra-right, nationalist, neo-imperial and conservative rhetoric in the old and new Europe and beyond, under the dominance of the darker side of globalization, let's say, which was intensified by this COVID crisis, by the economic recession, by imminent environmental catastrophes that are awaiting us, uh, all of this. Uh, making more and more groups of people uh, undesirable, uh, and not, not only people, but also other species that are sacrificed and discarded from Euromodernity as dispensable. At the same time, the COVID crisis, uh, with its biomedical coloniality, we can say, has also made it obvious that neither the globalist nor the yesterday populist solutions uh, actually can work, have any reliable answers to the mounting European problems as such. Solutions continue using the same means, the same old means and tools that created these problems to begin with. So more and more people turn into this kind of bare lives, like Gambanian bare lives, the new anthropos whose human rights are systematically revoked, restricted, inverted, and who are threatened, regulated, monitored, through disciplinary regimes and different forms of immobilization, such as racial, ethnic, and religious profiling of people, identity controls, uh, various uh, draconian immigration laws, and other forms of excluding people from the ontological reality. Uh, so the stereotypical media representation uh, of refugees, for instance, that we're all familiar with, or immigrants, is designed according to the same scenario that is born together with modernity. It's a scenario of dehumanizing and turning of live people into emblems of something, emblems of suffering or aggression, maybe a threat, symbolizing the deep internal contradictions of the European society, European identity in the conditions of this declining global capitalism. These contradictions are very much unresolved and unresolvable, and they somehow repeat Hannah Arendt's reflections on the inconsistency between the equal rights for everyone and the advantages given to citizens who are somehow seen as more human than others. Uh, and not just any citizens, of course, but those who were born in the country and belong to its ethnic majority. So these tendencies have acquired additional discriminating overtones during the pandemic when several European states banned entry for anyone except the citizens. And some introduced the requirements for longer quarantines for their permanent residents who are not from no, uh, who are from non-EU countries, even if they could prove that they haven't left the EU. So it's a very good example of how the biomedical face of colonial Coloniality stigmatizes these non-European bodies as potential sources of deadly disease.
Uh, neither the accepted European models of assimilation and integration, nor these increasing lapses into intolerance and racism that have culminated in the infamous, Im in infamous image of the fortress Europe that we all know about, has actually any future, because they continue to be built on the European superiority, on taxonomizing and ranking everyone else as subhuman, the internal European hierarchies that have stayed surprisingly stable in the last century, despite the tectonic ge geopolitical shifts and economic shifts, additionally work as these dehumanizing instruments. The world order in radica is radically changing and the European self-induced superiority, of course, cannot convince anyone anymore. The limitations of contemporary European critical thought and its inability to recognize many facets of the world beyond Europe, I think, are one more symptom of Europe and crisis. In this situation, Europeans face a challenging task to find some kind of balance between the extremes of the self-negating and paralyzing exercises of colonial guilt and the imperial nostalgia overflowing into this ultranationalist and racist fits. So critically dismantling both of these extremes, both of these possibilities, Europeans perhaps need instead to take a hard look at their own claims and inspect realistic opportunities. And what is even more important to downsize themselves to a more proportionate place in the world yet still realize the importance of their undeserved but real privileges. Privileges, as you know, in education, technologies, wealth, intellectual resources that should be used for the benefit of the world rather than merely provincial Europe. In other words, the post-COVID Europe entering the next stage of the global crisis perhaps should start from discarding its sense of superiority, its sense of exceptionalism, and building itself anew from a different set of assumptions than those that have led to this present crisis. Many thinkers have attempted to differentiate between internal and external others, as you know. The decolonial idea of imperial difference and also Laura Doyle's concept of interimperiality are maybe two interesting and uh, good ways of making sense of complicated European hierarchies in the past and a starting point for understanding their contemporary developments. The internal imperial difference referred to Euromodern capitalist Western Christian empires uh, while the Ottoman Sultanate or the Tsarist Russian Empire, uh, imperial entities, let's say, because they're not empires in the Western sense, with their non-European bordering profiles, became the external imperial difference because they were grounded in different language origins, different religions, economic models, ethnic racial classifications. So many ethnic groups and nations have been divided in modernity between different imperial influences and dependencies, sometimes simultaneously, sometimes in a successive way. In the presence of the imperial hierarchies, being dependent on one empire came to be more prestigious than on the other, and therefore has been systematically accentuated or, or erased. Uh, so joining Euromodernity has been also determined by the selection of specific imperial narratives on which the self-definitions of various nations and ethnic groups were based and still are based. These myths are still used in contemporary European politics of alliances, um, the choice, uh, let's say, of the, um, of the position and the role, inclusion, exclusion, and the projected models of the future. European inequalities and internal taxonomies often betray these imperial differences, which uh, uh, at times is complicated by also the post-socialist uh, inequalities that are mixed with imperial and colonial ones. One might think that all of these, all of these markers actually cease to be valid anymore in uh, the world, which is today very different uh, than it was even you know, 30, 40 years ago. Yet they continue to flourish and they continue to affect the global geopolitical relations, classifying humankind and defining the validity of people's lives in accordance with the original matrix of modernity uh, with its rigid uh, human hierarchies. Uh, and the imperial colonial 
critical lens allows perhaps to historicize and question the naturalized European self-assumptions of what Europe really is and who are Europeans, what are the differences between different Europeans, uh, how have they been constructed discursively, to question the naturalized lines between the pure nation state slots within Europe and with its non-pure exteriority, uh, to question both the residue of revamped statist restrictions and neoliberal global lawlessness and start thinking in maybe transversal terms in transnational and more regional terms, not as purely economic market mechanisms, but rather as an optic that allows to see more inequalities and injustices than a nation state approach or a cynical globalism could ever aim. The emergence of several new international unions and nodes questioning this reinstated unconditional Western dominance has resulted in their mostly failed attempts to establish a caricature of the multipolar world of asymmetrical and perpetually fighting enemy parties. Unfortunately, with uh, so far no global vision, a world in which any global responsibility is missing, is replaced once again with the sword law. From a decolonial viewpoint, the present shift from neoliberal globalism to right-wing nationalism and the obvious failure of both ideologies was actually not a new thing, was to be expected from the start, as under all their external differences, they have left the colonial matrix of power intact. The COVID-19 crisis has intensified the European uh, crisis of legitimacy, let's say, that was already going on, accentuating the gap between the often demagogical rhetoric and the void that was lurking behind. The fact that there are no values that all Europeans share today, no glue, let's say, that would hold Europe together anymore, that its internal divisions, often xenophobic and racialized, are too deep, and that Europe as a project is falling apart and collectively unable to define itself positively rather than in opposition to its constructed internal and external others, and relationally rather than according to its increasingly divisive logic. So Europe is indeed being downsized today to its more realistic dimensions and significance. And this complex long going process, among other things, leads to an erosion and the consolidation of the key defining groups within Europe and shrinking of the previously naturalized human hierarchies. The honorary Europeans or new Europeans who have been constantly put in their place and asked to prove their loyalty are starting to question their forever inferior position. Those who have been left in the waiting room forever increasingly delink from the European dream. The ongoing and upcoming larger crisis, both geopolitical and environmental, are likely to make Europe increasingly unattractive as a destination. Uh, the modern colonial human taxonomy continues, of course, to use agonistics and victimhood rivalry grounded in divide and rule principle as its most efficient tools of keeping populations at bay. It's assumed that everyone must take for granted the existing hierarchy uh, where we are all assigned a specific place and we're not allowed to change it. Yet people are falsely promised that it's possible to improve this place through progress and development. Agonistics goes hand in hand with a forever promised and constantly postponed or conditioned belonging to Europe. So that joining the EU or raising their status there once they joined is often dangled as a carrot in front of the whole countries, enchanted and re-enchanted with this ghost reward. Although more and more often, I think we witness also reactions against this type of disciplining and specific European forms of double consciousness that are based on the gap between the imposed ideal European image and internal unresolved contradictions that at once prevent from completely merging with this ideal and serve as a source of pride and difference. Once again, several imperial and colonial as well as geopolitical and ideological narratives clash in this complex into European entanglements that often lure the smaller countries into playing the role of model minorities through rigorously following all the EU requirements and their strife to out West to the West, uh, which nevertheless doesn't guarantee, of course, acceptance or inclusion. On the other hand, various others discarded from Europe, forbidden from entering and joining it, 
or acting as its unwanted internal others, are also infected by this victimhood rivalry, by a peculiar urge to take advantage of European belonging or association, yet take no responsibility for European politics in the past or in the present. For example, some East European and South East European moves, um, uh, we can use examples of this latter attitude, typically glossing over their own recent colonial status, the East and South East European states often attempt to cling to the real Europe, once again in the role of its equal participants rather than internal others. Whereas the stories of the past colonial atrocities are left to nurture the old Europe's sense of guilt, but not its recently joined members. So the East and South East Europeans opt, so to say, for the lighter side of modernity and refuse to deal with the darker side both their own and someone else's. Similar unreflected upon complexes are typical uh, for the borderlands and European semi-periphery that uh, to survive place, uh, let's say, on multiple boards at once. Yet the roots of these conflicting sensibilities are imperial colonial. The core European countries have a familiar deceiving combination of democratic and inclusive rhetoric and a hidden strategy to diminish the inflow of Eastern and Southeastern Europeans into the Western Europe in any capacity but seasonal and service workers with no rights or benefits. Therefore, the old logic of model behavior for probational Europeans or prospective Europeans is still at work. Most EU and individual countries' decisions for the migration problem, therefore, are not functioning because they are still grounded in othering dehumanization or alternatively in progressivism and assimilation or integration as this official rhetoric uh, goes. And then where should the newcomers integrate is another question. The growth of nationalist populist rhetoric hides the quickly eroding and dissolving idea of national identity in most European countries. The combination of failing economies that cannot accommodate people under just and humane conditions the realization of larger and larger groups of immigrants that no matter how hard they try to assimilate, still would never be accepted on equal terms or have equal rights in respective European nation states, is potentially creating more conflicts, uncontrollable and impossible to suppress by prisons, police violence or detention centers. According to many prognosis in the coming decades, the scope of migration will actually expand many times because dozens of millions of climate migrants and broader Anthropocene migrants will join the political and economic migrants of today. Meanwhile, the existing system of uh, centers and other forms of incarceration that become the main waiting zones for refugees for years, if not decades to come, and the border controls, deportation mechanisms, uh, the flawed system of coercive integration into nation states where more and more sizable parts of population are going to be immigrants soon uh, cannot and will not work and needs to be dismantled and changed. But uh, again, the dysfunctional politics and politicians continue to reproduce the outdated 20th century discourses that have no connection to social uh, reality or environmental reality of today. Uh, so in this situation, uh, uh, there is some hope maybe, and that's why I put it in the title of my talk, the hope could be in some alternative uh, communities of change that would be uh, formed and shaped by uh, local communities uh, in um, connection with, with other people, with other groups, with maybe some scholars, maybe some activists, maybe artists. Uh, and that would be coming uh, as a, as a bottom-up activity rather than something centered and controlled from above, from the state. So this will be uh, hopefully the system uh, of uh, that, that would be opposed to the existing nation states and international uh, organizations that are totally unable to answer the challenges of the age of unsettlement. Uh, so um, this arbitrary concept of Europe would then have to give way to other coalitions as it used to be actually before Euro modernity and is bound to happen again. So borders drawn along artificial lines, dissecting the living flesh and blood age old zones of cultural, economic and social cohabitation and interaction are and will be negotiated and problematized, whereas the erased and smothered 
transcultural phenomena, context, traditions might turn out to be more fitting for our survival and for our sustainment in the future than both the neoliberal global and the nationalist local frames. So this process of deflating Europe to its true scope, zooming in on its heterogeneity and dividedness into several very different areas, each with its own external links and pools, uh, would further erode the European fortress, uh, fortress walls, and uh, would accentuate its centrifugal tendencies. Importantly, it's needed not for the sake of some kind of repentance or symbolic justice, it's actually a matter of survival, which the current European matrix cannot provide for itself or for its internal and external others. And that's why, uh, in, uh, summing up, I would say that, yes, this regional bottom-up transversal communities of change and redirective action, such as elimination, remaking, unmaking, repair, striving to bring a future under their own control, can potentially emerge in Europe already in the near future, cancelling this top-down division of the European speciality that completely fails to provide a sustainable future for most of uh, its inhabitants. Such communities would arrive in a situation of gradual degrowth and post-development. Many of them could originate in the economies that were marginalized by free trade agreements, um, economies that due to robotic technologies in nations with advanced economies with large domestic markets uh, were di displacing the use of cheap labor, for instance, so that people were left with no jobs. So continuing to play the global modernity coloniality game would prove to be increasingly impossible, dangerous for such communities, and could trigger some kind of alternative practices and ways of thinking, which we can define perhaps as relearning to learn under non-ideal circumstances of the Anthropocene. Uh, thank you. I think I will stop here. Thanks. Thank you, Marina, for this intriguing keynote, um, which, as you said, already opens a wide field of questions and discussion. Um, thanks again, Maria, for organizing this event and for inviting me to moderate it. I'm really glad to now introduce the two other panelists who will um, now each speak for around 10 minutes and give an insight into their work and research fields. And I'm looking forward to the discussion that we will have afterwards. Um, as Maria already said in the beginning, um, you in the audience can send your questions already now and throughout the whole event um, to the phone number that you find in the description of the YouTube event. I'm happy to now introduce Yanis Panagiotidis. Um, he is the current research director at the Research Center for the History of Transformations, RESET, at the University of Vienna. In his work, he focuses on Eastern European studies, Jewish studies, migration, and post-socialist transformation. His book, Post-Soviet Migration in Germany, which was published in November 2020, is the first introductory book to the research field in Germany. And in his input, he will speak about the historical perception I'm sorry, <laughs> of Eastern Europe and the post-Soviet space within colonial structures. The third speaker I'm very happy to introduce is Vesia Kuczynska. She is a Kiev-based curator, art critique, cultural scholar, and researcher in the field of visual culture. She currently works at the Pinchuk Art Center Research Platform and in the Department of Screen and Performance Art Studies and Cultural Studies at the National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine. Living and working in Ukraine, she will talk about her understanding of the so-called post-Soviet condition and give us an insight into the Ukrainian art scene. Furthermore, she will elaborate on artistic and curatorial strategies of decolonization. Mm, we will first start with the input of Yanis Panagiotidis. Um, the Zoom stage is yours. Thank you, Yuri, for this uh, kind introduction. Um, I think it's already the second time this year that uh, you are moderating a discussion that, uh, that I have the pleasure to be in. Um, I think the, la yeah, the last time, I think we, we talked about, um, about post-Soviet migration, in particular post-Soviet Jewish migration to Germany. This time the topic is a bit um, broader, um, but in fact there is, at least as far as uh, my engagement with these issues is concerned, there is a connection there because um, 
as you mentioned, my um, my last book was on post-Soviet migration in Germany, so on um, immigrants from the former Soviet Union um, who came to the Federal Republic, mostly um, at the end or after the end of the Soviet era, um, many of whom belonged to um, to ethnic minorities within the Soviet Union, Jews, uh, but also ethnic Germans. Um, and in my work, I... I wrote, among other things, about their position in German society, which is a very peculiar one, um, because they are and are not immigrants in a sense. So they are clearly in, a, um, in the position of, well, of having immigrated, of having crossed the border, coming into the country. But um, they, they enjoyed a particular status, which differentiated them, um, well, among each other, like, Germans and Jews did not have the same immigration status, but both then had a different status than other immigrants and placed them in a very peculiar category of um, yeah, immigrants who are not immigrants um, and who are sort of in an intermediate position between the majority society, um, broadly speaking, and other um, underprivileged immigrants. Taking it from there, um, I, I started to engage with the issue of, um, of racism against these people, against immigrants from, uh, from the former Soviet Union, um, as well as from Eastern Europe more generally, um, and realized that, in fact, there is, um, there is very little, in my impression, there is very little about this, very, very little done, done on this, very little written about this in the context of German immigration debates, at least, because there is a notion that these immigrants are, are white. Um, and since they are white and they are privileged in many cases, they cannot actually experience racism. Um, and I'll get back to that notion, perhaps not now, but later in the discussion. Um, the thing is now, um, if we talk about racism, we kind of automatically um, have to talk about colonialism. At least there is a strong link in the literature and a lot of the discussions between these two phenomena. And so the question with regard to Eastern Europe is what kind of um, colonial past can we identify there? And um, I would argue that, and well, other are based on what other authors um, dealing with these topics um, have actually um, done. I would argue that, that there are certain elements of discourse and of practice um, that allow us to speak of colonialism and especially of German colonialism in Eastern Europe. Um, and now I'm, I'll be focusing on the past here mainly. So um, um, in the keynote, we heard a lot about the present and the future, and I'm sure we'll get back to the present and the future, um, but I'll focus, about, focus on the past now. And in this past, um, and in the past dealings of, of Germany in particular, with Eastern Europe, we can first of all identify um, notions of pioneering settlement in an empty land, empty land that could be appropriated um, as, as a first element of a colonial mindset. We can secondly identify um, the construction of the region's inhabitants as racially inferior. So there is this element of racism, which um, basically evolved from the 19th through the 20th century from a more cultural, chauvin cultural chauvinism, cultural racism to um, biological racism. And there's um, thirdly the notion of, um, of Eastern Europe as a, as a colonial laboratory where one could try out experiments in social demographic and spatial engineering. Now the, the most dramatic, drastic example of this kind of mindset and resulting practices in the past is known as the Generalplan Ost. So the Nazi grand scheme for subjugating Eastern Europe, um, for killing and or enslaving the local population, um, and for turning it into both a space of settlement for Germans and a space of exploitation, uh, thereby combining two types of colonialism, if you will, settler colonialism and exploitation colonialism. That's, I mean, that, that, was, that was the, in a sense, the high point of this colonial relationship between 
Germany and Eastern Europe during the Nazi era, during the Second World War. But even before the time before that, some authors, like most recently, for instance, uh, Christoph Kienemann, have identified colonial discourses and mindsets vis-a-vis the East in 19th century Germany. Um, and this, this work by, by this author is actually very interesting in uh, that on the, on the one hand, he identifies these, these colonial tropes and these colonial uh, notions in, in German discourse um, in, in the Kaiserreich. Um, but he also cautions us against two sweeping historical accounts of, so, you know, so to speak, German colonialism since the 12th century or so. And you find these notions sometimes. So sometimes you'll find this idea that, yeah, Germany has been colonizing Eastern Europe since the days of the Teutonic order. Um, so yeah, like literally since the 12th century. But in fact, um, these, this interpretation of sort of a continuity of German colonialism is actually a, um, a colonialist reinterpretation of the past. So this is a notion that came up during this colonial era when Germany wanted to become a colonial power and, you know, some thinkers basically argued, well, we've been doing this all along, you know, we've colonized this space um, of this, this empty space of Eastern Europe um, and have turned it into, into um, with broad culture and civilization and so on. Um, sort of reinterpreting a past in which there was indeed colonization, but not in the sense of colonialism, but in the sense of, what scholars nowadays would call in more and more uh, neutral terms, Landesausbau. So it was basically local rulers um, calling for colonists, for people to, um, you know, to make land useful, which is something that happened not just in Eastern Europe, but everywhere in Europe, basically, in the, in the mid Middle Ages and early modern period. Um, but this kind of pre-modern colonization was then reinterpreted as a, a long history of, um, of, of German colonialism. Um, so we shouldn't sort of um, throw out the baby with the bathwater and say, there is this, uh, like take this narrative at face value, but rather treat it as part of a colonial narrative of a colonial gaze that developed in 19th century Germany um, with a view to Eastern Europe. And of course this gaze then um, resulted in a very, as I said before, in a very violent um, colonial reality during the Nazi era. Some would say already during the First World War to some extent, but obviously there is a, still a qualitative difference between, um, between what happened in the First World War and between the whole scale genocide and, and colonial schemes of the Second World War. Um, and I mean, taking it from there, I think that, um, and, and, and picking up what Maria said in her introduction, that nowadays there are these still these invisible structures, these invisible colonial structures, which go back to the colonial era. Um, I think we have to to basically apply this 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 notion also to the case of Eastern Europe. So, if there was colonialism in Eastern Europe until 1945, we should not assume that the legacy has simply disappeared. And um, this goes for, I mean, for certain dependencies, which one can analyze um, along these, these, uh, these axes. And uh, Madina also alluded to this in her talk. Um, and this is also true with regard uh, to, the, to the issue of racism. So there was massive racism in Germany and not just in Germany um, against East Europeans until 1945. And it's not, it's not obvious or it's not clear or it's rather unlikely that this racism has just disappeared. And in fact, we can identify um, its, its resurgence after 1989 in particular, and then within the context of EU enlargement and basically until this very day in various shapes and forms. Um, so I'm not gonna go into detail right now. I'm sure we'll have the opportunity to discuss this later. Um, I would just like to make one last point with regards to Eastern Europe as a colonial space, um, which is that um, I think we also have to think about a sort of overlapping of colonialisms in this 
in this region, or perhaps a cascade of, of colonialism. So um, Germany, as I said, had this colonial gaze, gaze eastward um, towards Poland, but also um, towards Russia, and um, Russia and Ukraine in particular were sort of the, the desired colonial space um, of, of many um, 20th, 19th and 20th century um, German thinkers, Lebensraum im Osten, um, as they called it, living space in the East. But at the same time, Russia itself was arguably a colonial empire. Um, at least some would, some authors um, would make this argument that um, at least in, you know, certain parts of the Russian empire, like um, uh, in, well, in Central Asia and in the Caucasus, that Russia also acted as a colonial power. So it was the object of a colonial gaze and it was a colonial actor in its own right, which then I think is also important um, when we think about a, a cascade of racisms that exists in Europe where East Europeans are the, the object of racism by West Europeans. And of course I'm, I'm simplifying here, but uh, I think the, the in, in general, we can make this distinction. So West Europeans discriminate against East Europeans in racial terms, and East Europeans do the same vis-a-vis -vis other groups, Muslims, um, Caucasians, not in the American sense, but people from the Caucasus who are called black in a Russian context. Um, so we have basically a, um, um, yeah, a cascade of racisms there. And um, I think an important, an important point, and I will close with that, is that um, these things coexist and um, they don't cancel each other out in this sense. So just because somebody experiences racism doesn't mean that they can't be racist, but also, but also vice versa. So just because somebody is racist doesn't mean they can't experience racism. And I think this is an important, um, an important point to, to bear in mind in present day discussions. Thank you for now. Thank you, Janis. I'll now hand over to Lesia. Uh, hello. Um, good evening, and thank you very much for the previous, both previous presentations. And I, by the way, really agree with your last uh, statement, Yanis, about that uh, if somebody experienced racism, it doesn't mean that, if, that he or she can be the racist uh, itself. I think it's really like, in in more in a lot of cases it's even like uh, um, you know this structure where, where someone who were oppressed then start copying the behavior of oppressors so uh, that's really an issue which we should think about uh, so um, yeah I, uh, I am as I see our structure of the discussion I see myself as a kind of representative of this. Um, <laughs> colonial uh, colonial space of Eastern Europe, uh, like or marginal region, and uh, it is uh, really I, I feel this way. And uh, I wanted to say that I agree on the lot of, on a lot of issue that uh, Medina uh, were speaking, uh, but uh, and a lot of issues that Yanis was speaking, but. Uh, Previous speeches were more uh, in political or historical terms, and I would like to to speak about very similar things, but from more um, a personal uh, point of view, as a curator uh, and also as a person who uh, live um, uh, whole life in Ukraine, uh, uh, the country uh, with the I, I'm not sure about the. the um, uh, how accurate the term uh, is in uh, historical uh, from historical point of view, whether I can say that Ukraine has colonial past or not, but at least in metaphorical sense, we can use <laughs> this uh, statement, I think, because this feeling of inferiority or the you know, feeling of being the periphery of something big and great uh, is very well familiar for me and for a lot of Ukrainian citizens. And that's why also, this discussion of decolonization is really a hot topic for Ukrainian society. This is something very widely and very much discussed, and uh, a lot of um, a lot of like uh, fights going on uh, around this topic. And that's why I would like to say that um, first of all, if we speak about Ukrainian context, 
in Ukrainian cost, Yanis already told that there is kind of overlapping um, overlapping colonialisms in this Eastern Europe. So that's exactly what I was going to speak a little bit, because if you if you speak about Ukraine, the word decolonization is. Um, have like has two different meanings, and uh, sometimes those meanings are in conflict with each, with each other and are used by even conflicting groups of people. So that's a clash of different like decolonizing strategies. And first, and I guess the most common for Ukraine understanding of the word colonization is referred uh, mostly to the Soviet past and the history of uh, relationships with Russian Empire and uh, Russia as a, Soviet, as a part of Soviet Union or as a central part of Soviet Union. And in this case, decolonization often understood as the Sovietization or derasification, and it is an attempt to get emancipated from the so-called elder brother. And the second understanding is more close to our today's discussion is kind of devesternization or attempts to emancipate from the authority of the West, which is more recent, but also, if, if to dig deeply, we can find a more, you know, complex history of this uh, understanding of decolonization as well. Because, as you know, the part of Ukraine was um, uh, as, as, and under the rule of some Western countries. So, but I want to elaborate on this. So, uh, why uh, are these understandings are in conflict, as I said? Because for a very long period, the main decolonizing strategy in independent Ukraine after the collapse of Soviet Union and in Ukrainian art in, par in particular, was actually Westernization. It was Western thought and Western values, Western art, Western fashion, Western mass culture that was supposed to deliver out those tools for constructing new and independent and decolonized self. That's uh, this uh, lighter side of um, European, um, like myth, as you said, Medina. Yes, so, and that was kind of dreamed that out of the colony of Russia, we would become an independent and free member of this friendly family of Western countries, which was seen as a family of equal. And we have this chance to become one of these equal Western countries as well. And I, here I would like to show you a work uh, of, um, Arsen Savado, very famous uh, Ukrainian artist who emerged uh, in the 90s. This is a very famous series of him, which is called Collective Red, 1999. And it is, I think it is a perfect image of how uh, Ukrainian artists and a lot of Ukrainian people saw this decolonization through westernization. It's like this uh, old Soviet identity uh, infected with this uh, bacteria of Western freedom, which is represented as some, through some geisha aesthetic, this sexual freedom, this, um, uh, how it's called, uh, psychedelic uh, stuff and so on, uh, some fashion aesthetics. Uh, so I think it's really, a really good example of, of this dream, you know, of this image, how we will emancipate themselves thanks to this, uh, Western freedom and uh, all these, you know, good, great things about uh, uh, Europe. And this strategy is still very popular, as you, Medina, also said about it. And it is supported by official rhetoric of politicians and by cultural actors. And we are still trying very hard to implement those Western values and standards and theories into Ukrainian society. And uh, in, in, uh, art field, in art field in particular. And of course, those efforts are supported by grant programs of Western foundations, but even beside this, um, uh, you know, support from, from the state or from the, those Western partners, um, West is really looking very seductive for artists in particular, not only because of its financial possibilities, but also because, because of all this richness of culture, of artistic, intellectual life, and so on. Of course, I'm speaking here about the West as a fantasy, as we understand, as kind of a dream that our son Savada depicted. And here I would like to tell you about one of my favorite performances of Ukrainian art. Um, 
which was uh, a performance uh, by a Crimean uh, and Ukrainian artist Maria Kulikovska in collaboration with Swedish artist uh, Jacqueline Shabo, which is called Body and Borders. Maria actually called this piece a long-term performance happening, live event and act of solidarity, art, artist statements and the manifesto of sisterhood. That's how he defi she defines it. But what actually happened? What kind of performance was it? Uh, uh, during her stay, during Maria's stay in the art residence in Sweden, Maria officially married Swedish female artist Jacqueline Chabot. I also can show you the proof of it. Um, uh, here is uh, just a moment, I'll show you. So, here is the, the, the picture of the marriage. It was official marriage, and here is even the um, marriage certificate. So, it was a real, um, a real uh, legal event or how can a legal uh, legal um, act so yeah uh, it was real marriage <clears throat> uh, of ukrainian artist by the way she was she is heterosexual art uh, woman with a female artist Jacqueline Chibo from sweden so through this marriage, as they stated, the artist created same-sex family with what, as they uh, put it in the description of the performance, um, which was simultaneously legal in the first world country Sweden and illegal in the third world country Ukraine. This uh, legal ambiguity of the performed family pointed to the fact that human rights are distributed differently according to the nationality, but um, so it was kind of an artistic statement of this uh, gesture, but at the same time, an officially registered marriage created the possibility for a person from the third world country, uh, Maria Kulikovska in this case, to obtain residency in Sweden. So this marriage performance uh, really had a legislative outcome for Maria, as she really got the residency permit in the end. And she moved to Sweden for some time. So uh, what is also important that this uh, performance um, took part exactly after the Maidan Revolution, which was also called the uh, Euro Maidan, as you probably know, and was driven largely by this desire of Ukrainian society to become a part of European community. And against this background, the performance of Maria can be read as her personal implementation of this revolutionary dream. So applying the European values of sexual freedom upon her uh, personal experience and literally performing it in her lesbian marriage, uh, she gets her personal permit to European Union and its opportunities. And indeed, in three months after the marriage performance, Kulikovska did get, to Swedish, did get the Swedish residency permit. And then she, uh, by the way, she says that um, she obtained this permission with an extremely short validation date because it was homosexual marriage. In the case of heterosexual marriages, the waiting time of, uh, for authorization lasts over two years or more. And uh, the negative responses is recurrent in the case of non-European citizens. So staged as the promotion of sexual freedom and achievements of, Euro of European democracy for Ukrainian audience, the performance by Maria at the same time was quite a pragmatic case study of the possibilities of migrations. And um, after receiving the residency permit, Maria moved to Sweden really to work on collaborative projects with her artist wife, because Jacqueline Shebo was also an artist. And uh, here is the most interesting part, that in order to pay her way in a prosperous European country, she started to work as a dishwasher in a nightclub, following typical way of labor migration from, of labor migrant from Eastern Europe. And this side of the story is probably the crucial part of this long-term performance happening in live experiment by Maria Kulikovska. I appreciate this performance because it shows very well the relationships between the fantasy and reality, and it shows that the First step to decolonizing yourself is to face your real situation, your real position. But also what I'm thinking about uh, in regard to this performance, that sometimes probably you need to live through your fantasy to face the reality. Because it's like, you know, probably sometimes you need to be seducted and step in to then step out. So, she like believed in this fantasy of, of European happiness. She then performed it, then she lived through it, and then she faced her real situation. And that's something 
interesting to me. So probably this enchantment by the fantasy of the West and this attempt to make it real is sometimes kind of a necessary stage in the in the path of emancipation. Um, yes, but of course, this decolonization through westernization is just a search for a new master, if we speak uh, about Ukrainian case. Uh, but what is funny also is that uh, this de-westernization discourse in Ukraine often ends up with um, pro-Soviet or pro-Russian rhetoric, which is uh, which in the most vulgar form uh, sounds often like the Europe for the Europe we are a colony or just a source of uh, human uh, power, human uh, working power, but with Russia we are real brothers, and that is why I am not satisfied actually with known of these strategies of decolonization and I mentioned at the beginning is desovitization or devesternization. Uh, I am not satisfied with them because they are structured around this very powerful figure of the other, be it West or be it Russia. And it doesn't matter uh, that this figure is something we oppose to. It is still the structure of dependency. That there is someone we try to, you know, figure out how to deal with it. Uh, so, um, of course, I'm not the one who should, <laughs> who should declare what the colonization strategy is the right one, but I can share with you my own feelings of being a resident of this marginal uh, colonial space. And the main feeling, of course, is that uh, somewhere else, someone else uh, always knows what is right. However hard you try it, you always have a feeling that somewhere else there is some right answer or more precise understanding or more progressive thought uh, and so on. And uh, these feelings make you, makes you constantly try guessing the right answers, remembering <laughs> then repeating the right words, the right thoughts, the right concepts, the making the exhibition on the right topics. And that's something I would really get rid of. And the uh, attempts to get rid of this is my own strategy of decolonization. And I am trying to implement it in my personal life and in my curatorial practice as well. I would say that this is a strategy of ignoring the master, who of course is always present <laughs> and judging me, but still, you know, I'm trying not to pay attention on him. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for sharing all of these personal and also um, artistic works and thoughts. Um, as a first question of discussion, I would like to loop from what we have just seen back to Medina. Um, in your keynote, you spoke about alternative regional transversal communities of change that can possibly emerge in Europe. And we've looked a lot in the keynote on Europe. Um, I would now, after Alessia's input, shift the look from Europe to the East, to the post-socialist space and post-Soviet space, and refer to what you've written in several of your books, where you describe the post-socialist condition with the term of the void. Um, and I quote, like with the experience of being erased, a radical disappearance into nothingness. And now after having heard um, Lesia's input, I was wondering, how can, how, what do you think, how can this void um, be filled and used as a starting point, not from within Europe, but maybe from elsewhere? Thank you very much. It's a very important uh, question, actually. And I was, I was listening to, to Lesia with great interest uh, and thinking that, yes, this is a perfect example of decolonization. Uh, and the way you kind of, you know, formulated it was really great. And the point is, of course, that the void is constructed from outside. There is no void. There are people, there are thinkers, there are lives, you know, but it's just that we are seen as a void. We are seen as something that does not exist, as somebody that cannot produce knowledge, as somebody who's just sitting there waiting to be, you know, taxonomized. Um, and I think that, yes, the answer is that in all of these issues, we have to construct our own knowledge. We have to elaborate our own view. Uh, and not wait for some other ready-made theory that will be brought from the East or from the West or from God knows where, uh, because it's our experience, it's our lives, it's our effects, you know, that we have to work with. Uh, and I, I mean, I 
think that the process has already started because in the last several years, indeed, there is more and more people who are working with, with the coloniality uh, from their own vantage points. And uh, I'm very glad that it's happening finally. And usually it's people from the younger generation, I would say, that may- maybe finally we got rid of this old Soviet dinosaurs, you know, that were controlling the situation everywhere. And I see that there's a lot of really smart and brilliant young people who are trying to actually change something. And I, there is hope in that sense. Yeah. Mm, and Marina, you mentioned scholar like um, groups of maybe scholars, activists, and artists working together on this um, on these new communities. Now we've seen an example from art. And my question goes to Lesia and maybe also Marina, if you want to react on it. Um, what is the special potential of arts in places where people can? less directly ex- express political dissent because of repression? Um. Uh, thank you for the question. I think the role of art is uh, really crucial here because art is actually a space where, where there, is, there are no these right answers. You know, when in, in university or <clears throat> when they have the education, we still read the Western text or Russian text, because, you know, there are countries with much more powerful uh, culture and intellectual production. And we always learning from others and then trying to uh, to repeat the thoughts we've read. And um, I'm speaking about them myself because I also have this, you know, culture studies education and I also was raised on the Russian and Western texts and so on. Uh, And then uh, I moved to the to the domain of art and i found much more possibilities and much more freedom there because artists are people who uh, always work with the issue that are you know that are not articulated yet they didn't didn't formulate it yet so you when you in in the domain of art you're always going the first time on this path you know and this is i think very so if if there is a possibility of decolonization for previously colonized countries so probably it could start only with the art because art gives you this power of being of relying on yourself on on yourself only so you don't have any recipes because if you follow the recipes then you are not an artist anymore so you have to invent yourself your own position your own vision your own strategy your own recipe and that's the power of art and that's probably the greatest thing to rely on yourself <laughs> thank you would you like to react marina if not i would direct a question to Yanis as well <laughs> Uh, I mean, yes, I, I totally agree with, with what Lesia said. Uh, and I was thinking also that it's interesting that l- now time accelerates and there's so many things happening and it's very hard for us to make sense of it. And art is much better than any kind of social theory because social theory takes years to think, to come up with some concepts that are already outdated by the time they're published, you know. So that's why an artist is so much more important now because they sense the nerve of times, you know. And they can come up with some metaphorical thing without any verbal explanation or, you know, kind of you know, logocentric tradition of these texts that we're also tired of. And it's much more powerful. And it's also much more effective in the sense that, you know, the public comes to, to, to look at it in the museum, for instance. And they don't need the explanation. They just connect on an emotional level, maybe, or some other levels. And it's amazing how art can do that and how social theory cannot. Sorry. Yeah, that's true, totally. Agree. And also the mm-hmm. artists have this kind of right to be ignorant. They cannot know, they cannot be familiar <laughs> with all of it. And, and they also have the right for the mistake. They have the right to be stupid, uh, you know, funny and foolish and so on. This gives you tremendous, free, tremendous freedom to invent yourself and your vision of the world. I would now like to um, direct a question to Yanis. Um, Marina just um, 
said that new self narrations or self understandings might evolve in younger generations. And I know that in your work as a junior professor of migration and integration of the Russian Germans at the University of Osnabrück, you also conducted interviews with students of um, different post-Soviet backgrounds. And would you say that the specific post-Soviet experience is becoming less relevant for younger generations that you um, talk to as your students? Yeah, thank you for that question, which is a tricky question in a sense, or a question with no, no yes or no answer. Um, like on the one hand, yes, I would say the specific post-Soviet experience is becoming less relevant for, for, for some of them in the sense that it's not a lived experience anymore, or actually for, for those born in Germany, it, it hasn't been a lived experience, perhaps to some extent indirectly through their parents, through their families, but they've, they've grown up in a different, a different condition um, with a different background. Um, that said, I, um, I, I do notice a certain rediscovery of this, of this experience, of this story, um, perhaps precisely because the first generation often kept silent about about it about the the soviet and post soviet experience which by the way is not so unusual that first generations of something in this case of migration do not talk about their experiences and those remain to be unearthed by the second generation um, and this this search and this unearthing then also includes a search for new terminology one um, one example of which which in fact i did not encounter with my students, but actually after completing the book, is this whole notion of, of post-Ost, so the post-East, post-East, post-Eastern identity that, um, that, that you find, um, which I, in my impression is still sort of a marginal discourse, um, but it is, it is indicative of a certain change in positioning um, in the sense that, you know, there's, there, there's a search for something, for a particular, um, well, for a place in society, uh, for a place in the, in the discourse on migration, on diversity, where I think this second generation senses um, very clearly that they, well, perhaps they don't want to be um, just part of mainstream society, so to speak. Um, although some do, as a matter of fact. I mean, this is, this is sort of one of the privileges, if you will, of um, of the especially of the of the ethnic German immigrants from the former Soviet Union, if they are second generation, if they have a German name, um, a German surname, no no detectable accent, then they can actually become invisible. And um, in this in this you know this very classic, very crass um, sense of assimilation, and some actually, I think, want that. Um, and the families wanted that, but others do not want that anymore. Um, they don't just want to be invisible. They want to be visible, but in their own way, on their own terms. Um, and I think this is, um, this is quite interesting. And this is something that I'm, I'm really looking forward to observing over the next couple of years, how, how this plays out, because I think it's a very, um, it's a very rich field of, um, yeah, well, of, of call it identity politics. Um, I think it's it's um, it's really quite uh, quite promising. Yeah, I definitely see these developments inside the second generation because I guess I am or not. I guess I mean I am part of it. Um, I would like to. Uh, have, I guess because of time, um, I will only have time to ask two more questions so that we still have time to open it to the audience as well, although there are like many, many questions I would like to still ask. Um, but I would like to address another question to Janis concerning terminology, um, because in your input you explained why you use the term colonialism and you also used the term racism um, with regard to um, migrants from Eastern Europe or the post-Soviet space. And unfortunately, in these days on German Twitter, we find ourselves in a new wave um, of the trending hashtag Rassismus gegen Weiße, racism against white people. This is a hashtag that is repeatedly used from conservative feuilletons till the far right. 
Um, and it's very obvious that this hashtag comes from a point of view of trying to invisibilize or even reverse power relations. But also it initiates debates on whether the specific experience of white Eastern Europeans or post-Soviets can be described with the racism term. And then there is other terms um, emerging such as anti-Slavic racism or simply anti-Slavism. And I wanted to ask you what terms you use and why. Right. Um, well, first of all, this hashtag is a gigantic pain in the neck, a recurrent pain in the neck, because it keeps, it keeps coming back. And it, um, it creates a false dichotomy because there's these, these right-wingers who say there is racism against white people, so against us, you know, against them. And then there are their opponents who say, no, there is no such thing as racism against white people, and there can't be, period. And this is a false dichotomy because, um, as you also mentioned, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's an issue. I mean, this hashtag tries to reverse power relations, and power relations are crucial for, um, for understanding racism. And um, because there is this historical and also present day um, imbalance of power um, between, between West and East, if you will, um, we can't talk about racism against East Europeans, of course. And I think what is crucial here, and that's where the hashtag, as I said, once again, to use this metaphor, throws out the baby with the bath. No, well, the reaction to the hashtag throws out, throws out the baby with the bathwater when it says there is no racism against white people, um, arguing that, well, those people, even if there is racism against East Europeans, it's not because they are white. Um, and this is true. It's, it's not because they're white, it's even though they are white. And I think this is, this is sort of an important point there, that racism is not just a matter of skin color, never has been, um, but racial theorists of the 19th and 20th century went to great lengths to explain why certain white people were less worthy than others. Um, and those were first and foremost the Jews, who were sort of turned into the anti-race. Um, but those were also Slavs, and that's where we come to this issue of terminology. Um, this anti-Slavism, anti-Slavic racism is in many ways a, a historical notion. I mean, there is this, uh, there was this narrative of, you know, sort of the Germanic and the Slavic races clashing since the days of the Teutonic Order, or even since the days of Charlemagne, if you will. Um, and so that's, that's why anti-Slavic, this, this term anti-Slavic racism has a certain appeal to it. It has a certain um, historical depth, but I still, I'm still hesitant to use it because I think it's not sufficient. Um, there is clearly a, bro a broader view of the East at play here and of its inhabitants. And there is many, there's, there's different and overlapping um, types of racial prejudice there. Anti-Slavism is part of it, but there's also anti-Semitism still. There's anti-Roma racism, which is, which, is, um, which is very important. So there's like an intersection of, of different racisms, which for now I choose to call anti-Eastern or anti-East European racism. Um, but I'm still hoping for a better term because especially in German, it doesn't really sound nice. Like anti ost Rassismus is just not a term that rolls up the tongue easily. Unlike anti-Slavismus, which is somewhat catchier, but obscures many of the, of the nuances that we need to understand when talking about the phenomenon. Thank you. I actually wanted to ask um, a last question on the performance that Lesia showed. And now I saw that a question that kind of goes into this direction came already from the audience. And as we um, are already kind of a bit short on time, I think I will try to ask the two questions together. Um, first, my question uh, that I had prepared shortly, um, when I saw the, the, like the pictures of the performance um, you showed, I was also thinking about these narratives of the queer friendly West um, and the queer phobic East that, um, are also used as a form of othering again, and that also um, kind of locate uh, 
um, hatred against queer people only in the East and perpetuate this vision of um, the modern, tolerant, etc. West. And now the question that came from um, the audience, I will just read it out um, the way I received it. Um, do you think there is emancipatory potential in a performance by straight artists who explore and discover real lived experience of numerous queer migrants and wear it as a carnival costume? Um, don't you think this is in a way similar to neo-colonial colonial practices, something like cultural appropriation? Thank you for the question. I think uh, there is a certain emancipatory potential in this performance because, as I already told in my uh, presentation, uh, for me, uh, you know, this performance is uh, uh, the way when the artist lives through in her real life experience certain fantasies which are very strong in the society. So she take this fantasy and she implement it into her real life. So she, because this is also kind of a fantasy of Ukrainian society that we know that there is these options for the gay marriages in the West, because this, as you said, the uh, LGBT friend, the West, and also there is this desire to migrate to the West. And you know, Ukrainian people always uh, uh, trying to figure out certain strategy, how to move to the West. And this is one of the, so she kind of used this popular imagination, but she, uh, but she um, lived it through. And then she, uh, uh, like uh, leave this it to the to the final point of uh, of the realities. When she uh, married, she got this um, uh, residency permit, as many people dream about. And then she moved to Sweden, and then she started to work as a dishwasher, and then as a dishwasher. And now she is living in Ukraine, and she divorced with her uh, with her lesbian partner. So, and I think this whole story, how it developed from the beginning to the end. Uh, as lived by the real person Maria, who have this all uh, you know experience on her own skin, I think this is emancipate this have an emancipative potential at least for herself and probably for other people who for other for other people who you know fantasizing the same stories for themselves. But if you have another uh, view on this, I would <laughs> be interested to hear. Unfortunately, the audience is not um, <laughs> present here in the Zoom room to um, ask their questions directly or make comments. Um, but thanks for this question from the audience. Does one of the other panelists want to comment on it as well? Okay, for now, there is also no other questions um, from the audience, so maybe I can just ask another question and then give you all the opportunity for a last statement before I will try to wrap up what we have um, been discussing today. Um, I would like to direct this question to Madina. Um, and in the preparation of this event, I saw another lecture and a keynote that you gave in 2018 in Tallinn at the Kumo Art Museum, where you described your experience of international feminist conferences and networks. And it goes again a bit into the direction of um, terminology, which we have um, just been discussing. Um, and you said that when feminists from the post-socialist space are using concepts such, such as racialization, sub alternity, etc., to describe the post-Soviet condition, this is often seen as appropriation from post-colonial feminists. And now when you've been speaking about the possibilities of change and how to um, kind of make this happen, what are the challenges, but also opportunities when it comes to alliances between feminists, for example, from the global South and the post-socialist world? Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's, it's a very complicated question, of course, but I maybe start saying a few things about it. Uh, well, again, it's, it's connected with the global geopolitical tendencies in the world and also with the tendencies in knowledge production of who produces knowledge, who has the right to produce theory and who only has the right to uh, offer examples and be a native informant. And this is a, a 
what we called with Walter Mignola in one of our texts, uh, like a modern colonial epistemic contract that was launched in the 15th century. So following this logic, it's the Western feminists who produce theory, and it's um, the um, then the division uh, that existed before the collapse of the socialist system. So that was a feminist of the uh, the third world, as it was called then, and now global south, right? So they were responsible for things like racial differences, cultural differences that they could describe because it was considered their own experience and that they were allowed to talk about it. And feminists from the global, uh, from, from the second world or from the socialist world that now became a void. Uh, they were responsible for ideological differences and they were responsible for this so-called... Uh, you know, peaceful coexistence. And this is very well described by Jennifer Suchvent in one of her recent books where she describes the situation very well. And then what happened is that indeed, uh, after the collapse of the system, uh, the, the, the post-socialist feminists and gender theorists, uh, sexuality theorists, they were left uh, as a void because they cannot join the global south or the global north, they're in between and their knowledge is disqualified. And if they try to talk about race and they try to talk about cultural or, or religious difference, they it's not liked by the global South feminists because they think it's their realm, you know, they, they, they're entitled to it. Uh, and uh, I just experienced it recently because with my two colleagues, Suruchit Apar Bjorket and Redi Kubak, one of them originally from India and the other from Estonia, we uh, did a book together, a collection, uh, which is about dialogues of, of post-socialist feminists and, po and post-colonial feminists. And there was always this interesting you know, thing there that people from Eastern Europe, or, for example, from Ukraine, uh, there were, there's a wonderful article there written by two Ukrainian feminists. They are very open to post-colonial discourse. They're interested in, and they see their own situation very much in post-colonial terms. And that's why they talk about subalternization of women from Eastern Europe, racialization, and all these things, that the nuances that we've been discussing today. But when I talked and when we, tr we talk, we tried to interview people from the global south, very often there was this kind of wall, you know, and people said, no, we, we, we talk about racism, uh, but you are not entitled to that. Uh, and it was very funny sometimes and sad, too, because, for instance, they saw me as a white person, which I'm not, because I'm, you know, a person half from Caucasus, half from Uzbekistan. So, of course, in Russian understanding, I'm a black, right? But then uh, uh, taking this interview, I was always seeing this like, okay, so this socialism is about Eastern Europe. So, of course, we see you as part of Europe, and that's why you're an enemy, and you are also the rationalizing agent. And that was a very strange logic, which also has to do with this kind of, as I was trying to say in my talk, these divisions into these victimhood rivalries. So <laughs> each group has their own kind of, you know, victimhood story, and they don't want to hear other stories or connect with them, which is very sad. And I think this is what we have to fight with, because this divide and rule principle is what prevents us from doing anything positive together. We have to have genuine interest in the other story. You know, we have to listen to these other stories. Uh, and that's why we also thought well, we cannot just have in the book stories from Eastern Europe. We have to include stories from China, stories from you know other places which are also were also socialist places, right? Socialist countries, and some of them still considered to be socialist. And it's a completely different thing. And I think that many of these people from the global south they were surprised when we confronted them with this question and said, you know, Soviet Union was not all European. There were many people that were not European, so that's also part of the socialism story. So it's, it's, it's very complicated, very complicated, and not many people know much about it. Again, it's not their fault, maybe, but it's the kind of narrative, historical narrative that is imposed on us, you know, in universities, in the kind of education we all get. So, yes, it's, it's a very important goal and task for the future, I think. Thanks a lot for this statement. Um, regarding the time, I would now give Yanis and Lesia the opportunity to react or have a very short <laughs> final statement and then um, close this event. <laughs>
Okay, so um, yeah, I can actually just sort of tag along and 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 underscore what Madina said: this importance of um, of not falling into this competition of victimhood or whatever, but of acknowledging that there are different types. I mean, different experiences, but also similar experiences. And as I said before, um, there this might even include sort of mutual perceptions, uh, mutual racialized perceptions um, to a degree, but um, this is something to deal with. And I mean, I think the, the fact, I mean, what you were just saying that people from, you talk to from the global South see you as white, whereas others in Russia see you as black. I mean, this is, this is one of those examples. I mean, another example I heard from the research of my of a PhD student of mine that who who interviewed asylum seekers from Nigeria in Germany who complained that the Somalis were treated so much better because they are white in their view. So it's obviously there is there's many complicated um, constellations there, but it's key not to not to buy into these into these narratives of competition um out of mutually exclusive claims to victimhood or whatever but to actually address um well to address the fact that it's the same people sort of the racists are always the same i think this is sort of the key point there um no matter who the object is the racists are the same and uh, this is i think the the should be the point of departure thank you um lizia i give you the word Thank you so much, first of all, for the discussion. It was really interesting for me. And um, um, I guess I would, I would uh, finish, finish <laughs> end up with some wishful comment. I like this uh, idea of uh, Modena that we should um, uh, think about other coalitions. But when, when you were speaking about that, I was thinking about uh, based on this coalition should be based on what? And, you know, uh, uh, and I, it would be nice to try to imagine uh, this coalition based not only on the victimhood or, you know, similar, um, similar experience of being oppressed, but it would be nice to have uh, some more space for imagination of some completely different basis for, for coalition and in this case again art could be a good example because because i was so thinking about that, that when you look at the art groups it's amazing examples of how people can of how people can unite and create some similar not an identity not an identity based coalition based on you know some strange concepts or aesthetic views or some ideas not directly um driven from, you know, this uh, um, identity-based experience. And this is something that, you know, would be nice to dream about. <laughs> that would my... Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks to all of you. Uh, in my closing words, I would like to get back to the title of this event, which is part of a broader series. Uh, Maria already mentioned it in the beginning. It's called Other Europe, Perspectives on Identity and Diversity in Europe. And we've talked about Europe's colonial legacies and the still existing colonial gate, gaze towards the East, um, about different forms of racism and othering. Yet, um, what we've also just heard, like at the end of the panel, other Europe, as it was put um, also in the keynote, um, is also about the existing potential of solidarity in diverse and plural societies. And I really hope that this event will contribute to um, further discussions and exchange among scholars, artists, and activists, and that it will be fruitful for collective organizing, which I know from person ex personal experience um, is taking place already in different contexts, um, and that there will be spaces to find out more about these entangled histories and, and alliances that exist also outside of the simplifying East and West uh, dichotomy. Um, and I wanted to make a quick last remark and mention the work of the Post Post Studies Network, which I highly appreciate. Um, it's an independent working group and knowledge network for researchers on the topics of gender and sexuality, critical race and migration studies in post-Soviet contexts. And um, they have a website and do monthly meetings and a monthly colloquium on Zoom. 
they are great. <laughs> Check them out. And thanks for joining this event. Mm -hmm. And thanks to Camp Nagel for hosting us. Thank thanks you. a lot. Have a good evening. Have a good evening. Thank you.